Utah Senator Orrin Hatch, the longest serving Republican senator, senator in U.S. history. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Well, it's an honor for me. President Thomas S. Monson of the LDS Church passed away this week. Right. Uh, how would you characterize his impact on the LDS Church and on the world in general? Well, he was one of the greatest gentlemen I've ever met. He loved people, and it came through very, very strongly. Plus, he was a very intelligent man. He was an energetic uh, human being. He uh, knew what he was doing, and he loved the church and uh, set a very good example for all of us. I loved, the, I loved the man, and he was very friendly and kind to me. Tell us about your interactions with him. What kind of a man was he to you? He was as nice a man as you'll ever find. You'd think he was uh, your, your elder brother. And uh, he, he was kind, he was intelligent, he stood for things that you believed in. He was, uh, he was the type of a person that you just thought, you know, I like this man and I can follow him. What do you know about President uh, Russell M. Nelson, who will presumably become the next president of the LDS Church? I know him well. He, he was one of the world's great and early open heart surgeons at the University of Utah. I mean, he was without question one of the greatest surgeons in the, in the country when they called him into the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He's kind, he's smart, he's a person who can make judgments and who can uh, make decisions. So he's going to be an excellent uh, successor to our great uh, President Monson. Now, let's talk about retirement. <laughs> You've talked about retirement before, but what was it that turned the key for you finally now? Well, I really believe it's Elaine. Elaine, my, my dear wife of uh, many, many years, uh, she, she's put up with this for all these years, and I think she felt like it was probably time to give it up. She would have gone on with me. She, she always thought it was time to give it up, <laughs> but, but, uh, but she was also, also a tremendous supporter. And I think, I think I thought it through and thought, you know, she's put up with an awful lot and all the kids were gone. So she's one of the great mothers, grandmothers and great grandmothers in this uh, country. And, uh, and I, I decided, you know, I've done, I've done an awful lot in, in, in the United States Senate and uh, I owe her a better life. Mm. After all of these years. What was, it, what was it that your wife Elaine said to you that said, you know, honey, you're right. <laughs> well, she, she's always uh, felt like I, you know, I've been there long enough <laughs> because she, she's the quintessential mother, grandmother, great grandmother. I mean, she's just a wonderful woman, and uh, and I love her, and I'm very, very appreciative of her. We're we're, we're together 60 years, and uh, there's no no question about it. We've uh, we've uh, been able to hang together through all those years, and it hasn't been easy for her because. When I practiced law here in Utah, and really in the early days back in Pittsburgh, I was gone all the time. I was busy all the time. I was in really tough trials all the time. Uh, you know, and, and it took a really good woman to support all of that. And she was, she's the best wife I could possibly have had. Hmm. Now, your decision to retire will affect many, many people. Yeah. Uh, outside of your wife, Elaine, who else did you consult with before making this very heavy decision? Well, it's a decision you pretty well have to make on your own. But I talked to a lot of people, including a lot of my outstanding staff members. I, have pro I think I have the best staff on Capitol Hill and the best staff in Utah uh, in the state here. Uh, really good people who work their guts out for the state of Utah and the country as a whole. And uh, naturally they all wanted me to go ahead, uh, but uh, I think the person who probably made the most uh, uh, impact on me was of course always Elaine. Mm. Now over the course of your Senate career you became one of the most influential senators in U.S. history. And at the same time you have been one of the most influential Latter-day Saints <laughs> that has ever served in public life. How do you see that as part of your legacy? Do you see that as part of your legacy? I do. I, I felt very privileged to be able to be a church member doing a good job in one of the most difficult jobs in the world. And I have to say I felt like I was carrying the input of this church uh, forward. Uh, and I, I don't think I let our people down at all. 
and at least they tell me that I didn't. And uh, I had, uh, here's a young man who came originally from Pittsburgh who didn't have anything. Uh, I learned a trade, a formal skilled trade as a young man. I could very easily have gone into the laughing business, uh, general construction. Uh, but my mother knew there was more in me than that, and so, uh, and so I, and I knew there was more. So I decided, I received a $25 scholarship from uh, BYU, and I was so impressed with that because I, we were so poor. And uh, we lost our home right after I was born. And my dad built a home out of a torn down used business, old building. And uh, so we weren't used to very much, but uh, I decided to go to BYU. They sent me a scholarship for $25, and I was so impressed with that. I was so impressed with that that I thought, well, I'm going to go give this a whirl. When I got out there, I finally decided, my gosh, I'm enjoying this. Yeah. I like learning. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, went two years there, then went on a mission to Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then came back, uh, finished uh, school. I had to work a year or two in between. But came back, finished school, and uh, got my uh, degree in less than four years. And then walked into the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, they met me, and they gave me an honor scholarship, a uh, full scholarship for three years Wow! for law school. And that, that was the thing that really got me going. You have said that you would like to see Governor Mitt Romney run and take your place in the Senate. Have you consulted with him either before or after your announcement? I, t I chat with Mitt every once in a while, and all I can say is that I have great admiration for him. Uh, he would have made a great president, but he would make a great senator in my opinion, too. Now, I can't dictate that. I know that. All I can do is say that I hope he does give it a try. Uh, he would be a great asset to Utah and the country, in my opinion. And uh, uh, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to hear that Mitt is at least considering it. We're friends. Uh, I'll certainly give him any help he needs. And uh, as far as uh, once he gets there, I'd, I'd probably keep out of any uh, election process uh, because that's up to the people here. President Trump said some very nice things about you when he was here <laughs> in Utah, and uh, and for good reason. The two of you have a wonderful relationship. Um, did you feel any pressure from him to run? I know he asked you to run for an eighth term. Uh, when you had to break the news to him that you were not going to run for an eighth term, how did he take it? Well, I did have a lot of pressure from him, but when I broke the news, like the good man that he is, he immediately accepted it. He knew it was something that I had prayed about and that I had thought very seriously about and, and that this was no fly-by-night decision, and, and he immediately backed me. Mm -hmm. The man is a very good man. A lot of people don't realize. I mean, there may have been some times in his eight or nine years before this where people can criticize, but I have to tell you, he's a hard-working president. He knows more about the presidency than most people. He's carrying the ball on a lot of very important issues. He's already turned the country around. I thought we'd be in deep depression by now, uh, the way it was going at the time. And frankly, uh, uh, I have nothing but praise and admiration for him. He's an interesting guy. I mean, he's not easy. Uh, if, he gets, uh, if he thinks you're not doing right, he'll tell you. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and if you get, if you start slandering him, boy, he's going to give it right back, mm. <laughs> which, which I kind of find a lot of, a lot of interest in. Uh, Governor Romney and President Trump have had a very chilly relationship, very critical of each other <laughs> in public. And, and even though there has been an apparent reconciliation of sorts, they remain critical of each other. Well, they probably will anyway. Uh, yeah. uh, they're both really great leaders. If, if Governor Romney does wind up replacing you in the Senate, how do you see that chilly relationship between him and the president affecting the people of Utah and Governor Romney's effectiveness as a U.S. senator? Well, first of all, that's going to have to be a decision that the two of them make. But I have to say that um, the president's a big, big boy. He's going, to, he's going to win Mitt over, and Mitt is a big boy. And Mitt will know that uh, for him to really accomplish a lot, he's going to need the presidential backing. Uh, and that would be very helpful for anything he wants to do or any uh, decisions he wants to bring through there in the United States Senate, assuming that Mitt can get there, and I think he can. After 40 years in the U.S. Senate, 
if you had to choose a favorite political child, <laughs> what would you say that is? Child, you say? Yes. Because <laughs> no. so, so many bills and so many laws have your fingerprints all over them. But you're talking about a favorite. If you uh, had to pick a favorite. Favorite bill. Or political child, because uh, virtually you uh, were part of the confirmation of all of the U.S. justices on the U.S. Supreme well, Court. Right th now. That, that was very important because uh, that's some of the most important work that I've done, and I've had a lot of say in, in the type of a Supreme Court that we have right now. But if I had to pick one bill out of all of them, and it's difficult to do because there's, uh, I've passed, uh, I've worked on 700 bills that have become law. In fact, just this last year, 37 <laughs> bills went through. But if I had to pick one among all of them, it would be the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That, that demanded constitutional recognition of religious freedom in this society, something that we could not pass today and was difficult to pass back then. But I, I made Ted Kennedy come on board there. He wasn't going to come on board. I said, yes, you are. I said, you're going to come. No, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. And he did. And that was enough to bring the Democrats over and it passed, I think, with only three votes against it in the Senate and passed the House pretty, pretty, uh, pretty easily. But that, was, that is one of the all-time great constitutional bills. And frankly, uh, that couldn't pass today. So it took a lot of work to get it to that point, a lot of work to get people to vote for it the way they should, and work all over the country to get the people in the country behind it. And uh, frankly, uh, there are a number of other bills that are very, very important too, but if I had to pick one, that would certainly be on the, yeah. near the top of the list. You have about a year left in office before you actually retire. What unfinished business do you have at this point? Well, I would like to get this country's uh, tax system under control. We need to redo uh, our tax system and, and get it so that it's fair but also workable and that it, uh, that it uh, helps people to know they're not being gouged. Beyond the tax reform that, rep well, that beyond, is going into law? Beyond that, I'm in almost every major issue that there is. Uh, uh, you know, I've always been very interested in every, every issue uh, surrounding health care. I used to be a medical liability defense lawyer mm -hmm. in my days, and uh, early days. And, and I have to say that, uh, you know, the constitutional battles were always important. Every, every Supreme Court justice, many of the circuit courts, they were all battles that uh, I waged, and we won most of them. And I have to say, had we not won them, this country would be a very different country today. You and Senate, the late Senator Ed Kennedy's uh, relationship was a model, I think, in civility, political civility, and the two sides coming together and, and working together in the middle. What would you say is the key to getting a very polarized political environment in Washington to that point where you and Senator Kennedy's relationship Well, don't was. misconstrue that. We used to get into awful fights on the floor where we'd be yelling and screaming at each other, you know, <laughs> as only Kennedy could do. And I got so I'd scream back at him. And, uh, but when we got together, everybody would say, well, okay, get out of the way. Hatch and Kennedy have gotten together again, and we've got to support it. What's the key to getting back to that point? Well, I think we've got to get people who are not there for, just for themselves. I never considered myself uh, the sole reason why I'm there, uh, nor, nor did I consider myself the absolute guru on every issue. Mm -hmm. I also recognize that other people have good ideas as well. And even if I disagreed with them, I can mold them. Mm -hmm. I can help them to make them better. And I also realize that, uh, you know, this is a legislative body where you have to work together to get anything done. And to get it done, you've got to be strong enough and active enough and workman enough to be able to work it through. And that, that takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of energy, it takes an awful lot of uh, courage to do some of the things that really uh, have amounted to the greatest bills in history. Finally, as we wrap up, you have mentioned that uh, the next chapter in your political life, your public life, is about to begin. What does that chapter look like? Well, we formed a foundation called the Hedge Foundation. I hope everybody will donate to that because I can do so much if I can raise enough money. Uh, you know, Kennedy, when he, when he retired, they raised $150 million for his foundation. And that's still going up there. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting, nice thing. Uh, I don't have those delusions of grandeur 
because I don't think I'm going to raise that kind of money. But it, it would be wonderful if we could raise 50 million or more. And it's all going to go <laughs> to benefit the, our universities in this area and our school children and help them to understand, you know, one reason they want me to do this, a lot of people, is because I'm one of the people that proved that you can get along, that you can work together, that you can get Democrats and Republicans actually working together and to get things done. And if there's anything that uh, people are particularly fond of me for, it's that. And uh, uh, I'd like to see more of that, and I'm hoping that this foundation that we form will be able to do that. Uh, we've raised a, a, few, a few bucks for that foundation so far, but it's going to take a lot of money for us to do this the way that puts Utah on the map, that really does the job that needs to be done, that really will work closely with our university system in this state, and uh, really bring people to a greater awareness of government and what really, how really, really wonderful this American constitutional form of government really is. I've been all over this world. I've traveled it. <laughs> everywhere, almost everywhere, I should say. And I have to say, when I get back from those trips, I want to get on my hands and knees and kiss the ground out at Andrews Air Force Base, which is usually where we came back, and just kiss the ground, because this is a land of freedom like no other country in the world. And it needs to be broadcast. And I think the Hedge Foundation is in a position where it could do it, but we've got to raise a lot more money than we're raising right now. And you know, if, if you think you can't uh, give very much. Well, every dollar is important. So, uh, you know, if we had, you know, everybody in Utah, almost three million people, give a dollar a year, that would that would uh, go a long way. that would go a long way. But we've got a lot of wealthy people here who could do a lot more. And I'm going to give my papers to this foundation. Mm -hmm. It's affiliated with the University of Utah, so with the leading state school in this uh, in this uh, state. It has to be there because uh, we're going to have to work right in Salt Lake City and that's the closest uh, facility uh, that we can work with. Uh, but we'll make it so that every facility will be able to use it. It'll be online. It'll have a lot of things that, that will, I think, help our people to have an advantage in politics, an advantage in government, an advantage in life that uh, they would not otherwise have. So, uh, you know, I'm I would like to leave that as a legacy, and, and uh, I'm willing to work hard to see that that gets done. But it's going to take a lot of money, and I hope we can get it to wealthy people in this state, and even people who aren't wealthy, to give to it so that, uh, so that uh, it has the money to be able to say, hey, Ted Kennedy's not the only one who has a foundation that really is going to portray his point of view. Yeah. Warren Hatch, who knows his point of view and, and has his own point of view, uh, is more likely to present information across the board than Ted Kennedy's people. And, uh, and frankly, it would say a lot for Utah and say a lot for the University of Utah in particular. I don't mean to shun any other university, but it's right here in Salt Lake where it has to be. Well, Utah Senator Orrin Hatch, the longest serving Republican U.S. Senator in history, Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. My privilege, and you really do a good job of interviewing. Thank you so much. Senator. Thank you.